Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Robert Watson to discuss George Washington's final battle, the epic struggle to build a capital city and a nation. Robert P. Watson is a distinguished professor of American history at Lynn University and the author or editor of more than 40 books, including The Ghost Ship of Brooklyn, An Untold Story of the American Revolution, The Nazi Titanic, The Incredible Untold Story of a Doomed Ship in World War II, and America's First Crisis, The War of 1812. He is a frequent media commentator and activist who has founded three nonprofit think tanks dedicated to civic education, political reform, and fact-checking political campaigns. To moderate today's conversation, we're joined by Rhonda Martin. Rhonda is a member of the Board of Directors and serves as Secretary of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library in Hollywood, Florida. She has been instrumental in arranging, coordinating, and hosting a variety of lectures and programs for library patrons and the surrounding community. Rhonda recently retired from Miami-Dade County Public Schools, where she worked as an administrator for over 30 years. She's passionate about reading, history, and travel, and her goal is to visit all 63 U.S. national parks. Throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to pose questions by clicking the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen and you can order your copy of George Washington's Final Battle from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. There you go, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So glad you could be here. A little bit more about Dr. Watson's book is um, following the War of Independence, the leaders of the new country struggled as to whether to establish a national capital and where to locate it. Through George Washington's political skill and leadership, he was able to move the capital from New York City to Philadelphia and finally to the present location on the Potomac River. Washington oversaw the planning, design, and building of the capital city, Washington, D.C., which serves as a source of pride and national landmark for our country. Dr. Watson's book takes us on a fascinating journey from George Washington's early years through his presidency and ends in 1809 with Thomas Jefferson moving into the completed presidential home, later named the White House. I wanted to mention, um, this is the first time that Robert Watson and I have met in person. I've seen him many times. Uh, I first saw him at a presentation at the Lifelong Learning Institute and have been a fan of his ever since. And such a great fan that he, um, we got him to speak on Zoom lectures at the Sterling Road Library. He has done several six, times. Yes, six presentations and he's one of our favorite speakers and he has made history a lot of fun and um and i've read several of his books because i am such a great fan and, and um, but not all 40 and dr watson you bring a new perspective to history by discussing little known historical events in incredible detail i was riveted to this book and came away with a much greater appreciation for our nation's early leaders and our capital city. And what I wanted to do um, right now is to give you a little bit of background about Washington, the place where Washington DC is now in the 1780s and what our nation was struggling with after the War of Independence. So I'm gonna read you some excerpts, or actually we'll both read some excerpts from Dr. Watson's books. Against all odds, George Washington and the Continental Army managed to win the War of Independence. 
The cessation of military operations in 1783 brought a long-awaited peace to the former colonies and freedom from the crown. But the struggle for independence was not over. For the colonists, it would not be a simple matter of transitioning from soldier to citizen or from revolutionary to American. The civic vacuum created by the end of the British rule posed a number of immediate and daunting challenges. The question on everybody's mind at that time was, what happens next? That's well written. Who wrote that? Yeah, <laughs> you wrote that. It's in the introduction. I haven't gotten to the main section of the book. The future of the new experiment in popular government was already in jeopardy, such that Washington, usually guarded about his political opinions, felt it necessary to encourage his countrymen to support the struggling government. Okay, I have two I'm gonna read also. Let me just first thank Rhonda for uh, agreeing to do this, and I've enjoyed working with her on the half dozen other programs, so thank you so much. And Christine and everybody at Books and Books, thank you. Uh, I'm not shy about saying it's my favorite bookstore, and I, I love going there. And Mitchell does a remarkable job with it, so, uh, uh, be sure to continue to support our local bookstore. So thanks, everyone. So here's a, another excerpt. Washington was beginning to recognize the need for a federal capital that would function as a commercial and political hub of the country. This city, he would later hope, would be a beacon for freedom, unite the bickering states, and promote a sense of, na promote a sense of nationhood. It would end up being built alongside a river that he knew well and greatly admired. And one more to set the tone for you. Uh, this is from the end of the prologue of the book. The American experiment in Republican government was altogether new, meaning there was, one might say, no script to follow after the war. The capital city, like the nation, would be built from scratch. In that respect, the city's birth paralleled the forging of the nation and Washington's own story. Their histories and their fates were connected. And then from there, I jump into the story. Okay, I just wanted to say one thing. I wanted to thank you for asking me to help uh, be a commentator on this um, event with sure. books and books sure. because I've really enjoyed watching you on Zoom and now meeting you in person. I just want to ask you a question to get started. As well as being an award-winning author, you are a media commentator, visiting scholar, community leader, and distinguished professor at Lynn University. I think the audience would like to, little, uh, to know a little bit about you more personally, and what inspires you? Okay. Well, first, I don't sleep. <laughs> but yeah. um, I've always liked history. Um, I literally, when I was in college, when I was trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do with my life, I kind of nerdy, but I, I wholeheartedly recommend it to my students for the last 30 years that I've been a professor. I made a list of all the things I wanted to do. And it was an enormous list, it kept growing. And I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. I wanted to be a you know, fight for wildlife conservation. I wanted to be an ecologist. I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. I thought about being a paleontologist. Uh, I had a giant, I wanted to be an author. I wanted to, and then I really sat down and I thought, Problem is, if I do one of those jobs, I won't be able to do the rest, right? Um, and how can I kind of do everything? And I love history, and I love to write, and I love to read. Um, and then I had my eureka moment. If I become a professor of history, I can be an activist. I can fight for human rights and civil rights and women's rights. I can fight for the environment. I can write books about it. I can, and um, and then as an historian at a university, it allows me to travel, which is a great passion, as, as one of your passions. I've been to almost all the national parks, and I lecture on cruise ships and lead history tours around the world. It allows me to do that, because it all ties into my job. So really, uh, history uh, is just, it's our story. And, um, you know, the stories from history uh, stay the same. It's just the names change. So uh, whether you're interested in a struggle for rights or war and peace, or whatever the issue is, or social history, uh, it's the one discipline that I think transcends everything else. So if you're someone like me that just has so many interests, uh, it was the perfect field 
discipline. And um, being a professor allows me to indulge all my other passions and hobbies and interests, and it's all related to my job. So I guess that's where it came from. Also, I wanted to thank Lynn University for hosting this event um, in their studio. And we're sitting in the studio connected to the theater where we hosted the 2012 main presidential debate between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. Uh, it's literally right beside where Rhonda and I are sitting. Okay, it's good to know. Um, as you stated earlier on one of the quotes that you read, the capital as well as the nation had to be built from scratch. Why did you pick the subject of George Washington's struggle to build a capital city to write about? And in particular, and in this book in particular, how did you do your research? It's very extremely detailed, interesting facts. <laughs> so how did you do your research? Um, well, the research is, uh, was, was easier than for a lot of my projects because all the principal people, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, your principal uh, characters in my story, all their letters have already been collected, edited, organized. So usually I'm in libraries and archives around the country or in Europe, you know, in the basement digging up these manuscripts, but they have all been organized. So that was easy. It's just that most historians and authors on Washington have, for a variety of reasons, have ignored this important aspect of his life. So I wasn't finding and discovering new documents, but I was mining a new angle of it. What I did find was I went through a lot of old newspapers, uh, you know, probably 25, 30 newspapers and hundreds of articles. I also found that Washington appointed three commissioners who were in charge of the federal district, what we now know as DC, the District of Columbia, named in honor of Christopher Columbus. Uh, so I went through their letters and between their letters and the um, uh, newspapers, I was able to follow a day-to-day trajectory of the city literally unfolding with each page. And so um, this research was timely and intensive, but not as difficult as other ones. I came up with the idea for the book, two reasons. Uh, big fan of George Washington, and who isn't? If it uh, hadn't been for Washington, Rhonda and I would be drinking tea today because we wouldn't have won the war. Um, but of course, the entire forests have been felled to fill the pages on Washington. So I wanted to try to find one aspect of Washington that I thought everybody had missed. I came up with the two. One, I love our capital city, as you mentioned earlier. Who doesn't love the tree-lined mall, uh, the majestic Smithsonian's, the remarkable, awe-inspiring government buildings, the memorials and monuments to our heroes and the fallen. I love our capital city, but I found that very few people know about the story of how it came to be. And it's a great story full of twists and turns and intrigue. And it was one of those that unfolded against all odds. It shouldn't have happened uh, had it not been for Washington. Um, so I wanted to tell the story of the capital city. Of course, Washington is the main protagonist. Secondly, George Washington, in my opinion, and I've argued this my whole 30 year career, of all the founders, he's the least knowable. In terms of across the two centuries, Washington has come across to us as more myth than man, more monument than flesh and blood. He's depicted almost monolithically, you know, singularly as this stoic general. Washington was a complicated person. So what I wanted to do was peel back the layers of the onion and flesh out who George Washington was. And in particular, there are a couple of sides of Washington that I think we're really missing. One is he was a politician. He's always depicted as being above the political fray. Well, now we tried to carry himself above the political fray as a way of uniting all factions that were emerging. But Washington could be a politician. He could twist arms, threaten, lobby, swap votes with the best of them. Of course, he was a politician. Uh, he even, when he was first running for office, had free alcohol at all of his events. You know, I came across one letter that was a joke that Washington was not a, an exciting speaker, a captivating speaker. He was pretty stoic and understated. And they said that more people came out to his events for the alcohol than to see him. There's a great story in this book where uh, when Washington is, is, when they're having a vote on the location of the Capitol, on these momentous issues, there are four votes shy in the Senate. Now that may not sound like a lot of 100 senators today, but back then there were only a few senators. So four votes shy in the Senate would be like 25, 30 votes shy today. 
an impossible obstacle. So Washington instructs Hamilton and Madison, call for another vote immediately. And they think he's mad. You're four votes shy. Washington says, call for another vote. He goes to visit four senators. Shortly thereafter, they have the vote, all four flex. <laughs> so Washington was a politician. The other side of Washington I wanted to flesh out is Washington was actually a visionary. He was creative. He was innovative. Uh, he was entrepreneurial. At his farm, he grew crops that no one else was growing. He would, you know, the Tidewater Virginia area, it's good soil for tobacco, but not good soil for a lot of other crops. He was experimenting with everything. He had a greenhouse. He was growing tropical fruit. He did aquaculture, a fish farm. Uh, he, was, he was so innovative. Um, during the Revolutionary War, Washington lacked a formal military education. Heck, he lacked a formal education, which means he didn't know what he was doing. He was making it up. He was like the grandmother that throws spaghetti on the wall, right? See if it sticks. If it worked, he stayed with it. If it didn't, he tried something new. So Washington literally was making it up. There had never been a war quite like this. And he was making it up as he went along. He was creative and innovative during his presidency. Remember, our nation, this republic that Lincoln would later call of, by, for the people, was altogether new in history. The office of the presidency was a brand new, no office like it before on the planet in history. So Washington had no blueprint, no template. He once again found himself making it up, flying by the seat of his pants. But the creativity and the innovation of Washington shines through. So when you look at the capital city, Washington, it should have been Thomas Jefferson or James Madison, classically educated, well-traveled, that came up with this creative vision to build a brand new city so that the city and the government, both of which are new, would grow up together um, and inform one another. But it wasn't, it wasn't any of the well-educated, classically educated, well-traveled, brilliant framers. It was George Washington that came up with the vision. He was the visionary. And that's a side of him that we really don't see. So if you put those two things together, the story of the Capitol and Washington as a person, nowhere else do you see Washington's creativity, vision, and politicking come into play better than on behalf of building the Capitol City. So that was the inspiration for the book. Okay, well, you've shown us a new, or many of us, including myself, a new side of George Washington. Um, in your book, you talk about extensive debates among the nation's leaders on where to build a capital city, the size, the design. Um, Thomas Jefferson wanted a minimalist capital. George Washington wanted it to um, simulate Rome and Paris. Um, so at first, the proposals included New York City, Philadelphia, and even having ro rotating locations. What were some of the difficulties in choosing a permanent site for the capital city? And what were some of the benefits of ultimately having a capital built on the Potomac River? Good, good question. So um, we went from 1775, which is when the Revolutionary War started, until November 1st, 1800, which is when John Adams moved into this capital city that still was a construction project. We went 25 years, a full quarter century, without a permanent seat for government. Now, winning a war to start a new nation and not even having a capital is not the right way to go about starting a nation. So we went a quarter of a century without having one. It was so difficult to reconcile. I found multiple quotes from Washington, but also all the other framers. Uh, during the Constitutional Convention, we all know, we all learned in school, the three-fifths clause, the debates over slavery, the Electoral College, these were vigorous debates. Uh, the framers were at one another's throats, and these were heated exchanges. But Washington and other framers wrote often that of all the constitutional debates, the single debate that was the most charged and heated, that had the possibility of undermining the entire Constitution, was the capital city. Where should we build it? How big should it be? How do we fund it, etc.? cetera? Uh, that was the debate. So what the framers decided was they would try to solve everything else in creating this new nation, but not solve where to put the capital. So we, we finished the Constitutional Convention in the hot, humid summer of 1787 with no capital city. Um, so the problem was there were at least 30 cities under consideration. 
uh, Albany, New York City. Brooklyn, believe it or not. Uh, in um, Maryland, from Baltimore to Annapolis. In Pennsylvania, from Harrisburg to Philadelphia to Lancaster. Um, so sites everywhere. The problem was, the, the debate was, to answer your question directly, parochialism. Everybody wanted the capital city to be in their home city, in part because of pride you know, in your city, uh, but mostly economics. The Revolutionary War lasted from 1775 to 1783, and the British had blockaded the Eastern Seaboard, which meant no trade, no commerce, businesses went under, our currency was worthless, the country was in dire economic straits after the war. And if you were to get the capital city, that meant that the entire federal government the military, the Congress would all move in. It would be an economic windfall for your city. It would be a construction boom. So everybody wanted their own city. And therefore, the people of Albany were undermining New York City's campaign. New York City was undermining Albany's. But while they were undermining one another, Baltimore and Annapolis were undermining New York's. And New York was undermining Maryland's. But then Baltimore and Annapolis were undermining one another's. It was a political knockdown drag out for a quarter of a century to the point where, as Rhonda mentioned earlier, frankly, um, Ben Franklin even said, well, why don't we have multiple capitals or a rotating capital? I don't know how serious Ben was, but just to try to get people to think outside of the box. So they came up with a joke, and I found this in a number of letters of members of Congress. Um, the joke was because Congress was so darn unpopular that they would build a Trojan horse, hide Congress in it, and wheel it into the city at night. Congress would quick it out and do its business, hide back in the horse and wheel it to the next city. So um, the political debate was raucous, it was volatile, uh, and to the point where they kept putting it off because they thought it would literally undermine the Constitution. For example, uh, some Southerners said, if we don't get the Capitol, we walk. They were unwilling to negotiate, compromise, cooperate, none of the things that make up a democracy. Um, so that was the difficulty. Ultimately, Washington plays the lead role in citing it where it is today on the shores of the Potomac. And the advantage to that, as per your second question, was um, uh, if the capital was in the north, the south might not play ball and vice versa. So by locating it halfway between the north and south, almost the epicenter of the country, it would unite both north and south. We also knew because of primitive transportation, rudimentary communication systems, all great cities, all great civilizations are born next to a body of water. You need an ocean, a, a lake, a bay, a river. And this location gave us the Potomac, the Great River, the Chesapeake, a great bay, and access to the Atlantic. So it seemed to fit a lot of the things Washington had in mind, plus, it was on land near his house and land that he loved. So let's not forget that as well. So. Yeah, it was very interesting in your book how they determined the final location. But as you said, it went near Washington's home of Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. It was interesting today I read in the paper on this date in 1789, George Washington and his wife moved into the presidential mansion in New York City at that time. So. That was when the capital was located in New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was quite apropos to read about that there we today go. with your book. Yeah, they were supposed to be inaugurated on March 4th. That was the original inauguration date, was March 4th. Today it's January 20th. It was moved up uh, in 1937 for FDR's second inauguration as per the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. But so George was supposed to be inaugurated March 4th. He ends up not even moving in until the end of April as you said, and he's not inaugurated until April 30th because there was bad weather and not everybody got the memo. I mean, the Postal Service was, was brand new, right? Um, and because of the difficulties of travel and everything else, they're a, a, you know, a good month and a half late. Not a good way to start a country, not a good way to start a presidency, but he more than made up. For it. Yes, so New York City was our interim capital for a year and he used a federal hall which I'm guessing most everybody's been to, right there on Wall Street next to the stock market, uh, right down the street from my favorite place in New York City, and that would be the Francis Tavern Museum, which is where George Washington and Hamilton and they all went for lunch and dinner. And it still looks the same. And you can still order cider that was made according to the recipe from back then. And right near Trinity Church, where Alexander Hamilton was buried. So 
that's where that's where it all began. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, one of the things in your book you talked about an ugly and tragic part of American history, slavery. It's discussed throughout your book. Unfortunately, many of the nation's leaders at that time were slave owners, including Washington and Jefferson. Um, when the Capitol was being built, the US did not have much of a skilled labor pool. They had to get immigrants from Europe to help build the Capitol. They also used freed black men and also slaves. Slaves were a big part of the building of the capital and they got, they had the worst jobs mm -hmm. um, in the quarries and it was mm -hmm. really hard to see that it was happening back then. But, um, and a lot of us don't even know that. I didn't know that for sure, but I wanted to read a quote. Michelle Obama remembered the slaves that built the Capitol and the White House. In 2016, she said, I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. Well, at the same time that the slaves were laboring in the quarries, we also had some educated black men. Benjamin Nabanneker was one of them. He was a free black scientist, and he was hired to help as a surveyor with the building projects. And Banneker actually wrote a letter to Jefferson Jefferson believed in slavery at the time, and Jefferson also had written um, about the inferiority of, mm -hmm. of people, the blacks at that time. Mm -hmm. And Banneker, I read in your book, actually Close wrote enough. Jefferson mm -hmm. and tried to um, get him to change his mind about African uh, slavery and the inferiority of, of the slaves as Jefferson believed but it didn't work at that time. Right, right. Um, so the next question I was gonna ask you is about the um, Apple City and the buildings took much longer to complete than the 10 years Washington had anticipated and planned for. Unfortunately, Washington passed away in 1799, a year before the president's house could be completed and even occupied. It took another 10 years mm -hmm. under the leadership of Jefferson to actually complete the president's house, which was later named the White House. What do you think Washington would have thought of the capital city when its initial construction was completed in 1809? And what would he have thought about the present day Washington, DC? I think he'd be very excited and proud of it. Um, as you noted earlier in our interview, Jefferson wanted a simple federal town. He wanted single story, one, one story brick, homes, uh, simple, separated by fields and woods. Um, whereas Washington, as you said, wanted Rome and Paris. Mm -hmm. He wanted a city greater and larger than London and Paris, which was, which was an extraordinarily bold and ambitious, if not audacious idea at the time. Um, but you know, what comes into play here, and I think one of the reasons Washington would like the city today is what I, I call in the book, I have a section where I talk about the politics of architecture. Think about it, Jefferson's representing Southern slavers. They want slavery to be supreme. They want states' rights to, to, to be sovereign. If, if you have a very weak, minimalist federal government, the states and slave owners run the country, run the show. So the politics of architecture, if you have a simple little federal town with one-story brick buildings and woods, it, it symbolically shows the weakness of the federal government. Washington wanted the federal government to be strong, to unite the country. He realized, one, we are not, uh, we have no credibility in the eyes of Europe. Well, if we have a little, I mean, how are Parisianers and Londoners going to look at us with credibility if we have a little one story brick, you know, uh, a couple hundred acres? Washington wanted a greater city which would give us respect in Europe. How could we conduct diplomacy, treaties, alliances, trade if we don't have their respect? Two, Washington realized that we lacked a spirit of American identity. We, people did not have a sense of nationhood. If you were to take a time machine, Rhonda, and go back and meet Thomas Jefferson back then and ask Jefferson about his country or his nation, he would say Virginia, not the United States. And in fact, a lot of them wrote the United States, capital letter S, states, noun, small letter U, united as a descriptor. And oftentimes, here's what you find in, in the letters of everybody at the time, these United States, plural. B, small letter U, United, capital letter S. 
After this, Washington wants the singular, capital letter U, noun, United States. Um, so he thought a great capital city would imbue the people with the spirit of national identity and pride. So we would be Americans and be united. Um, he also didn't think that this fledgling nascent republic would last. Our government was in debt. Uh, we still had threats from the French, the Spanish, the native residents. Uh, the North and South were already forming sectionalism and factions. Nascent political parties, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, were emerging. Washington didn't know that we would make it. So a great, glorious city for the ages would help. So Washington brilliantly solves all these problems through one great capital city. So I think he would love this great city today that is a beacon of liberty and freedom. It's a symbol of, of democracy for the planet. Anybody around the world, when you think of democracy, you see an image of the capital, uh, which is why the ridiculous attack on the capital city as, as past January was so disturbing to me and, and you and everyone else. But um, here's another reason Washington would like the city today. He even wanted, talk about a vision, he wanted a national university. We had a handful of colleges, William and Mary, Harvard, what is today, Princeton. Um, and Washington knew we needed an educated populace. When the British left, guess what? All the doctors, lawyers, physicians, uh, you know, architects, they all left, all the professors. So we needed, so Washington wanted a national university. Guess what we have today? We have American University, where my son is a junior. Um, we also have other great institutions in that city, like uh, G Georgetown, I mean, who's the publisher of my book, George Washington, named for George. Um, so he also wanted it to be a hub of culture and commerce that would attract the best and brightest from the world. And today, Washington, D.C. features the Smithsonian. Um, it, 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 the, you know, the, the Kennedy Center, it is a world-renowned hub of culture, commerce, politics, and uh, so it's become the kind of city and then some that he envisioned. So I think he would like it. To the other point about slavery, it is a cruel and bitter irony that the city was built by slaves. The entire capital city was built by immigrant labor and slaves. Um, the architect who designed the city was an immigrant, a Frenchman named L'Enfant, Pierre Charles, a.k.a. Pete uh, L'Enfant. Um, he was classically trained in France, uh, and he was a Mason, like Washington, which was important. He had fought in the war with Washington with great courage and valor, by the way. So Washington knew him, trusted him, he was brilliant, and he most importantly shared Washington's vision for this incredible city of the ages. He, you know, the Gonfalz the one who designed the wide boulevards that intersect, and wherever there's an intersection, there's a large public park with monuments and memorials. So all the things that we know today. The person who designed the White House was another immigrant, James Hoban from Ireland. And again, Washington heard about this great architect who designed some public buildings in Charleston, South Carolina. So he goes to look at them, falls in love with them, and invites Hoban. Um, uh, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, who grew up, who had French and English ancestry, takes over and is one of the chief builders of the city. Washington wanted these Romanesque and Greek columns and all the buildings and with a lot of embellishments. Well, that requires some skill, so enter the Scottish stonemasons. So it's immigrant labor, ironically enough, which we need to remind the nativists and xenophobes in this country, and it's slave labor. And when John Adams moves into the city, he and his wife Abigail, who joined him later, they were appalled to everywhere they looked, there were slaves toiling to build the city. Uh, Many of the framers hoped to avoid using slave labor, but they ran out of money. And Southerners who had opposed a great glorious city, they realized once it was being built, at least they could make money off of it by leasing their slaves to build it. So the government had cheap labor, and Southerners who ironically enough opposed everything made money off the building of the city by leasing the labor. You mentioned the quarries, Rhonda. Can you imagine Quarrying tons and tons of rock needed for these buildings uh, without the type of equipment we have today. They literally used a pick and a shovel. A number of slaves died toiling around the clock year round to build the capital 
City, which is a cruel irony. So Michelle Obama was right. She got heat on the day that she said that. She was absolutely spot on. It was Bill. I still agree with her. And to get back to what you started to speak about earlier, we have Washington, D.C. It's just a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, what was it, in 1850 or so, the Washington Monument was built to recognize George Washington's contributions to the Capitol? And it takes years to build. They ran out of money. And you can see, if you look at it today, you can see where the stone changes. So you can tell how, how high they got. And, they, and ironically enough, there was a link to the building of the Washington Monument. One of the people that lived long enough to help raise money and support the project was Alexander Hamilton's widow, Eliza Elizabeth, um, who uh, Hamilton was Washington's right-hand man, as they wrapped in the musical. And, uh, you know, Hamilton wrote Washington's speeches. He, uh, he, he negotiated much of the negotiations that would be, uh, that would result in the capital city and the formation of the government. Washington used Hamilton as a spokesperson and negotiator. So there was that direct link to George Washington through Eliza, uh, who lived to be uh, 97 in a day and age when people consider themselves blessed to make it to 50. So, Very yeah. interesting. Um, speaking of Alexander Hamilton, he, Washington, Madison, and Jefferson, they were, the book centers around them as the founding fathers quite a bit. Can you find anybody, any group of people in modern history that might have such an influence and so much power and were so successful? You know, I would say during Lincoln's presidency, we were blessed to have Lincoln. And Lincoln had a, a worthy cabinet in Seward and uh, Stanton. Uh, he had other advisors, Bates, Chase. So there was a, there was a real talent around Lincoln, and Lincoln was extraordinary. If it had not been for Lincoln, I don't think we'd be in the state together. And I, I put my reputation on that. that. We've been blessed at other times. Um, our country seems to have been blessed during times of crisis. You have the right people in charge. Um, that goes back to the old debate, pardon the sexism of the old debate, does the man make the times or the times make the man? You know, Teddy Roosevelt uh, contemplated that, and only Teddy Roosevelt, who was president from 1901 to would say this, I'm cursed to be president in a time of peace. Therefore, I won't be great. Uh, but Teddy Roosevelt was so remarkable that he utterly dominated the political landscape in the early 1900s and ushered in what we would today know as unions and labor, child labor laws, food inspections, conservation. He's the father of conservation. Teddy Roosevelt was the first American to win a Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating the end of the Russo-Japanese conflict. So. Uh, and then also we see this talent pool, people that just dominated the times in World War II. We were blessed to have a Franklin Roosevelt, my hero, Harry Truman, in the critical post war years. It's hard to even imagine. It's unnerving to imagine where we would have been had we not had Truman in power. Uh, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, NATO, statehood for Israel, civil rights, so many of these more foreign aid, so many of these more Ventus issues. It was Harry Truman. Um, but, you know, today, Rhonda, I think of all the deficits. We have a trade deficit, we have a budget deficit. The most difficult deficit I think we've been suffering with for years is a leadership deficit. I don't think anybody could name some of our recent presidents and some of our congressional leaders, and even with a straight face, uh, suggest that they would be on par with the Washingtons, Hamiltons, Franklins. I mean, think about that revolutionary. George Washington, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. I mean, even Hancock, Ben Franklin. I mean, this is, Ben Franklin is America's Leonardo da Vinci, right? Or as I always say, Leonardo is, is Italy's Ben Franklin, you know, or, or you know, Lawrence's. But um, um, an extraordinary gathering. Arthur Schlesinger, the late great historian from Harvard, uh, used to always say, and, you know, jokingly, but to make this point, it's almost as if there was divine intervention. What's the likelihood, as this nation is being formed in the 1770s, what's the likelihood that that many extraordinary, you know, once in a century, once in a millennium, people are alive? They're alive at the same period of time, in the same location, and they gather in the same city for the same purpose. Um, you know, 
a way to think about it is if we were to redo the Constitution today, it would be unnerving to think of, you know, Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi redoing the, you know, and Marco Rubio for crying out loud. Um, that's when you really appreciate the genius of that, that, that set. And um, not only were they geniuses, but they all had a public service ethic that they put Sir Washington, Hamilton, and others considered public service as the most honorable. They talked about the public trust. It's the most honorable thing somebody could do. I don't think a lot of our you know, uh, elected officials today fit that description. So um, we were blessed and fortunate have those folks in place. And the proof is in the pudding. It worked. The Constitution worked. The capital city worked. Yeah. And it's incredible what they were able to accomplish Remarkable. and get our nation on the right foot. But with the leadership of Washington. I'll give you one example. Yeah. During the Constitutional Convention, you know, we often envision the framers as standing around like Captain Morgan or something, just enjoying <laughs> one another's company. They were at, at one another's throats. Yeah. Uh, they were arguing. It was a heated but where they differ from a lot of our, our Mitch McConnell's today is they were able to compromise and find common ground. They could find 50 of them. Today we seem utterly incapable of finding the greater public good. It's all about self-interest. Um, but at one point, they were out of their seats at one another's throats in a heated argument. And Washington, who knew he was out of his league intellectually, he was no intellectual slouch, but he was not well read like the rest of them. Washington just sits quietly in the corner of the room. His contribution to the Constitution is twofold. His sheer presence gives the whole convention credibility. And everybody knew that if he put his signature on that piece of paper, everybody would say, okay, because George had such gravitas and respect, transcended everyone else. But secondly, at one point when they were arguing, some of the framers were this, they were out of their seats arguing. Washington explodes out of his chair and gives them <laughs> um, he gives them the look and they all quietly scurry back to their seats and sit down. I cannot think of anyone today, not even LeBron, <laughs> that has that kind of global, that universal respect and admiration. Uh, all George Washington had to do was stand up or give people the look and it quieted everyone down. It allowed the Constitutional Convention to endure and continue. So um, and that's the kind of stature and leadership that he brought to this endeavor. And I found a couple of examples, just real quickly, that some of the founders kind of chuckled about Washington, saying that he had a fever. In other words, he was obsessed with his capital. It was his focus. Uh, others even said that he's almost incapable of focusing on nothing but this. It was a tenure, all intensive, the last 10 years of his life, it was his number one priority. Because he knew if we built the city, it would allow and enable the nation to endure. Uh, and that was his obsession, and thank goodness it was. It's amazing that he could be the president and coordinate and supervise the building of the Capitol and all that it entailed at the same time. Yep. Um, Washington could walk and shoot gum at the same time. <laughs> he, was, he was a multitasker like a new mother. <laughs> I think that we're going to get close to our closing time. I have a couple more questions. Um, you've written about a lot of time periods, a lot of wars, actually. That seems to be you know, where history is made. You've wrote, written about the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, Civil War, World, World War II, and um, plus current day politics. What is your favorite time period or subject to research and write about? Um. So I, it's not that I like writing about wars. I'd rather, much rather, rather write, write about peace, yeah. human rights and women's rights and civil rights. Those are the things that get me up in the, out of bed in the morning. But um, by writing and focusing on war, that's when we really see human nature. We see the evil that people can do to one another. And wars oftentimes throughout history, not oftentimes, always, usher in a great technological surge forward. Technology always, the mother of invention is, is necessity in, in wars. Um, the state of technology leaps forward during wars. Uh, social change occurs during wars. In the vacuum after wars, when we oftentimes see a political power struggle, when we see rights for certain minority groups or others, we see the treatment of those who lose the war. So I see writing about wars as a, as a, a you know, 
as a lab for studying human nature. My favorite periods, uh, I have two. I like the revolution and I like the World War II era. Uh, in part because I'm such a Harry Truman. I, yes, you um, are. I, he's my hero. So uh, it, it, studying the World War II era, the greatest generation, as Tom Brokaw said, and, and defeating global fascism. I mean, how can you not write about that? Um, and even something like D-Day, I've had the great honor of being able to lead tours and lecture on the landing beaches for the 70s and 75th anniversaries, plan to go back to the 80s. Um, to, to, to be around that generation and to be on those beaches, how do you not write about that? Um, and of course, when World War II ends, this is, we see the birth, or at least we plant the seeds for what becomes civil rights, women's rights, expansion of health care, social security. All this, you know, grows out of the depression and the war. The revolution, the birthing of a brand new idea, an ideal, is the way to look at it. Um, and to, to go beyond what the Roman Senate had even tried to do, to go beyond what the classic Greek philosophers, what, you know, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and the wildest dreams he could contemplate, and, and make it a reality. Um, how do you, now, the framers were fallible, they made mistakes, but what a generation. So those two periods in time, I think, um, and I imagine for the rest of my career, however long I do this, I, I will continue to write about those two periods because they're so compelling. And there's so many stories and lessons whether you want to talk, as I said, about rights or war and peace or whatever you want to talk about, human nature, those are great ways to flesh out those big questions. Well, in this book, I hope you all <laughs> buy it. Um, Good plug. Anyway, um, there's so much more than also about building the capital city. I mean, it's just so much detail about what's going on in starting our nation. So I really appreciated that, too. Um, Thank you. And um, I've, read, I've read a lot of your books, The Nazi Titanic, The Ghost Ship of Brooklyn. That's why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've got two books I need you to autograph okay. after this. But um, are you writing another book? And can you tell us about your next book? Yeah, I've got three projects at, at all different levels. I have a book being released this summer on the Civil War. Um, I'm real excited about it. It's called Escape. It's about the largest prison break in American history. And it occurred at a wretched Confederate prison in Richmond. And it wasn't just a prison. It was a site of Confederate propaganda. It was a house of horrors. horrors. It was a charnel house, a torture chamber. And uh, so it chronicles not only the Civil War and tells that story, but the story of the prisoners enduring. And they made a mistake they captured at the Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, they captured a Pennsylvanian, a colonel from the 77th named Thomas Rose, and he has an idea. He tunnels out of the prison, and it's the largest prison break, but to make the story even, I mean, you couldn't script this. I couldn't make this up. Half get captured, half for free, some get killed, some live, and before the John Wilkes Booth hunt, it was the largest manhunt at the time. So it's a, it's a fast-paced roller coaster of torture, of horrors, of war, but then this, this escape. Uh, so that comes out this summer. Um, I finished the first draft of a book I'm tentatively calling When Washington Burned. It's the bookend to this book. This book's about the building of the nation, the building of the capital. This next one, it should be released, my guess would be January, February 2022, uh, also at Georgetown University Press. It's about the capital city, the capital city being burned to the ground, August 24th, 1814, by the British. And when it was burned to the ground, it looked like the United States was going to cease to exist. The British had invaded our city. They had three massive armies, one in the north, one in D.C., and one in the south. And we were done. And against all odds, we managed, after losing darn near every battle in the War of 1812, we have three big upsets, and we win the northern, central, and southern theater. And, and we, we, we continued. But they didn't want the capital to stay in Washington, D.C. They wanted to move. And it was pretty much Dolly Madison rifled to President James Madison that said, no, we are going to stay here, we are going to endure, and we are going to rebuild. So Dolly was an early, I don't know, Eleanor Roosevelt, Michelle Obama, or Joe Biden, or a very powerful, influential woman. So that's, that. Uh, and then the third one I'm working on is about a pandemic similar to what we're facing today in American history. And there's some lessons about uh, 
you know, some preachers and conservatives said it was a hoax, it was fake. Uh, they said, just pray. And of course, many of them then died. Uh, there was a debate in the healthcare community. Uh, there's social distancing, there's mask wearing. So there's an interesting parallel to what's been happening today. So I'm working on that as we speak. Leave it to the women and the immigrants to get things done. So, <laughs> so I, I'm just here to remind folks watching that you can post questions. We don't have any yet, but if you'd like to, you can go in there and post a question. Meanwhile, I have a question for you. Um, in all your research on George Washington, can you tell us what you like best about him and also what you like the least? What I liked the least was that Washington knew slavery was wrong. And what you see during his life, like you see with Lincoln and emancipation and slavery, you see a constant evolution of Lincoln's thinking. Um, to the and evolution in the right way. Lincoln is growing. He, he's, he dedicates himself to a life of self-improvement. Same with Washington. So what I like about him is what I don't like. Washington's a you know common man, uh, grows up without the benefit of travel or an education, but he dedicates his life to self-improvement. And he's always working on it to the day of his death. But yet he knows slavery's wrong. And he evolves to the point where when he dies, he frees his slaves. Uh, and he's writing about it and it's wrong, but that's the, probably the one issue that he does not speak out against. Uh, he speaks out, and when Washington speaks, although he's a man of few words, and I also found multiple references, I was trying to figure out what did he sound like, because he lived in, in the pre-audio, pre-video era. They described that you would have to lean in, because he barely moved his mouth and kind of whispered under his breath. Um, but when he spoke, few words he spoke, it, it changed everybody because he was so well respected, but he didn't speak out on that. So that's what I liked the least about him. What I liked the most was this just creative, innovative vision, this lifelong commitment to self-improvement. And you really see, um, it's fun to study the growth of this, uh, you know, ambitious, awkward, big kid into this unbelievable world leader that he becomes. So yeah, good question. So I've got another one. So are there diverse voices writing, now writing history? And how do you think they see George Washington? Yeah, there certainly are. Um, the discipline of history, just like the sciences or literature or philosophy or politics, it's, uh, it's, it's a broad tapestry of ideas and arguments. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think there's strength in diversity of thought, and it wouldn't be a good academic discipline if there weren't vigorous disagreements. So yes, absolutely, history is filled with a, a cacophony of voices and arguments. And you know, I've been to countless conferences where people applaud what I say and people yell at me, and we have our debates. Um, happily, this book has been. I was I was intrigued, a little worried, a lot excited to see how this book will be received. Uh, happily, so far, we've gotten uh, enthusiastic thumbs up some, from some really impressive historians and leaders in the field. So I've, I've been excited about that. But um, yeah, there's sort of a revisionist uh, slant um, and there's sort of your more traditionalists. Washington now is front and center again because of the debate over the monuments, uh, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the resurgence, I guess you could say, of, of hate against the Asian American community. Um, and a lot of other difficult things that, yes, George Washington was a slave owner, but yes, we have memorials and monuments to him. I have always been an advocate for taking down the memorials and monuments to Confederate leaders. They attacked the United States. They, were, they killed hundreds of thousands of people. They shredded the Constitution. They enslaved people, and they sent us their sons to die to perpetuate human bondage. We don't need to have Fort Bragg named after that Confederate general. We don't have to have monuments of Jefferson Davis and so forth and so on. Now, having said that, we shouldn't tear them down as a model. It should be a teachable moment of public dialogue and we should remove them in a civil manner through a vote and put them at battlefields. If anybody's been to Gettysburg, it is just a, a, a acres of memorials and monuments that educate us. The key is to educate, not celebrate. Uh, and we can do that by putting them on college campuses and museums and historic sites and in battlefields. 
rather than just tear things down. But I do believe the monuments and memorials to Washington deserve to be put down. The quandary is the classical historical debate, your first class as an undergraduate in history. We can't judge things in 1776 with the 2021 perspective. It's contextual. There is an exception to that. I've always taught and written and argued that certain things such as slavery or genocide or sexism, certain types of hate and, and violence transcend history. You can use a 2021 perspective to judge any cool event. Therefore, Washington com doesn't come across well because he was a slave owner and he didn't speak out. On the other thing, the totality of his accomplishments, I'm not saying they outweigh that slavery because that is a gigantic blemish, but the complexity of looking at it, the totality of his accomplishments at least merit a state being named after him, a capital city being named after him, his picture on our currency, the 555-foot monument in Washington, D.C. being in his honor. He does deserve all of that. So there is that complexity in that debate today, um, interesting. Um, and it's a good debate to have, and we should have this civil debate, and we should all weigh in on it um, and, and have a dialogue. That's the why history is so fascinating. Absolutely. So we do have a question from the audience, and someone is asking, what's your opinion of fellow Washington historian Ron Chernow's success with a hit musical, particularly with his unusual way of popularizing history? I have the great pleasure of knowing Ron Chernow. I like him. Uh, he and I actually wrapped the whole intro to the Broadway musical Hamilton together in front of a large, sophisticated audience a couple of years ago. <laughs> so uh, I take great pride in being a different kind of interviewer, I suppose. I was interviewing him for the show. Um, so I, I'm a fan of Chernos. I love his work. Um, as I do John Meekham and, and David McCullough and Doris Kearns Goodwin and Gordon Wood and Joe Ellis, these are some of my favorite historians. Why? because they focus on the person. You know, I love history, but I've spent my 30 years complaining about the way we teach it and the way we write it. It's almost like we take the people out of history. You know, you're probably like me in that you love history, but you hated your history classes because it was rote memorization of dry dates. I like to focus on the loves, the losses, the triumphs, the tragedies, the scandals. That's what makes every movie good, every novel good, every opera good. So why shouldn't history be the same? And I think the gift that Chernow has, which you know McCullough and others have, Doris Crohn's Goodman, is they, they, they write it in such a compelling prose and they focus on the individuals. Um, and I love that Chernow has, has been able to popularize uh, Hamilton and, and kudos to Lin-Manuel Miranda. Um, I'm nerdy enough that uh, several years ago when the Broadway musical hit, started to get big, I fact-checked the entire, what is it, two hour and 50 minute musical, line by line by line, the entire thing. I did it because I wanted to push back against historians and critics that said, oh, we have a black George Washington, a Puerto Rican Hamilton, an Asian Eliza, you know. I don't care, I'm fine with the colorblind casting. It's over 90% spot on. Lin-Manuel Miranda had Ron Chernow consulting on every major scene. Chernow told me personally he loved the depiction of Washington in the musical, as do I. I think it captures George perfectly. I'm good with it. I don't care the race of Washington. It's the character that is accurate. And anything that gets young kids excited and brings the public out to learn about the Federalist Papers, for crying out loud, <laughs> count me in. Um, so I'm a huge fan of the musical. I've seen it more times than I can count. Uh, I've given lectures before the musical at the River Theater forums where I talk about Hamilton's backstory. Uh, and I do programs for K through 12 kids uh, that are going to go see the musical. I, I did it in Fort Lauderdale, uh, where you are, when it was at the Broward Center. I work with school groups and train teachers so that they can get excited about Hamilton as a way of learning about the Revolution, the Constitution, even the Federalist Papers and our founding. Uh, so yeah, Cherno did a Cherno is an incredible writer. Um, okay, well that is so great. Uh, I need to see you and Ron Cherno singing at Miami Book Fair. <laughs> <laughs> we need to put you together. You no, know, well, uh, I'm sure if anybody could do it, Mitchell could get in there. 
absolutely. You know, yes. Turn on I rapid. You can join us. Uh, Rhonda, can you join us as well? <laughs> oh my God, this has been so great. Thank you so much for joining us, for being with Books and Books, for bringing this great program to us, um, for getting together in the same spot, which is kind of um, a new look for us. We've been vaccinated. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. Thank goodness. So I just want to remind everyone watching that you can order your copy of George Washington's Final Battle right here on the screen. Click that green button. We'll ship it right out to you. If you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores, we've got them there too. And I see that someone has slipped in another question. Let me just see. Oh, it's just someone saying, amazing. So they've obviously enjoyed the conversation. This is from Willow Christich. Maybe you know her. I do. Okay. He's a teenager. Isn't that great? That the young kids are, are paying attention to history. Awesome, Willow. Thank you. I'd be happy to come down to Books and Books and sign copies. Uh, uh, so, yeah, just say the word. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you, Rhonda. It's great to meet you as well and know that you're out there. Um, I'm sure our paths have crossed at some point um, at Books and Books. But anyway, thank you again for being with us today. And we'll see you soon, hopefully, in person. Thanks to the audience. Hasta la vista. <laughs>